Thank you for inviting me here today. My name is Steve Hampton. My fascination with the Dean Drive started in 1981, and since then, I've built over a dozen various inertial propulsion engines, and not all were Dean Drives. But the drive we are presenting today is based on that system, and we'll see how it works. But first, let me ask the audience a question, and this has happened to me. Have you ever unzipped your jacket while talking on the telephone? Now, some people might get the wrong idea, and you might try to recover by saying, golly, it's hot in here, which doesn't help. In the same way, the Dean Drive has been subjected to a quick and dirty analysis, when in fact, its operation is not as simple as it first appears. Dean drives are a dynamic and complex multidimensional system. Multidimensional sounds like sci fi, but in a way, the Dean drive is a time machine that appears to snub Newton, when in fact, the machine obeys all of Newton's laws. Most of us are convinced we know how a Dean drive works. We don't. I thought I did until I actually built some. So the first part of this presentation exposes the secrets of this phenomenal machine. I would like to acknowledge Glenn A. Robertson, my associate, who was instrumental in the final development and testing of the drive we are presenting today. I hope you enjoy our presentation. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction, but not immediately. Taking advantage of inertial delay, inertial lag. Breaking centrifugal force from rotary motion for propulsion has eluded us humans for millennia. The hurdle, it seems, lay in the way we tend to think about our world at large. In the past, we inventors and engineers generally thought in terms of how to lasso the rotor by manipulating a spinning mass on a stationary scaffold. The quest is and always was to generate unidirectional force from rotary motion. Yet few of us considered giving the scaffold free range in the corral to harness the rotor. Furthermore, knowing how to do something may not be as important as knowing when to do it. Norman L. Dean found that elusive answer by manipulating time within the cycle of a spinning rotor. But first, he had to convert the rotary motion into oscillations. You can use any eccentric rotor and rectify it to get an unbalanced force simply by diddling with the pace of T. Manipulating time? How is that even possible? Let's say your deranged uncle died and left you with a thousand used cars and they were just delivered into your backyard. You drive one car for a mile to a dealer, haggle for a bit, and sell for a pure profit, but you have to walk back home. You drive another car to the same dealer haggle, and sell again for a profit, and walk back home. You repeat this cycle until you've sold all of your cars. By then, you have enough money to move into a new home. This is how a Dean Drive works. Your car lot may be likened to a source of electricity. You are the eccentric rotor in a Dean Drive that is shifted when you save time by driving to the dealer. 
to your neighbor who is not quite certain that you either A, reserved a rubber room at the Renfield Hotel, B, lost the Q-tip, C, took one on the coconut for the team, D, found Snoop Dogg's ashtray. From your neighbor's perspective though, your cycle of driving away a car and walking back remains constant. But to you, time is saved driving to the dealer. You spend that extra time in, in haggling out a profit and then spend an equal amount of time you did in driving and haggling on your return walk back home. Externally, the system appears balanced. Internally, it's unbalanced. It's a question of different inertial frames of reference. Likewise, Dean drives convert energy from electricity cars into rotary motion round trip, and then into an oscillatory action repeated round trips, then shifting of the rotor, your drive, the clutching of the rotor, the haggling, to create centrifugal force profit. The walk back home is within new space. So how did Dean change the pace of time in a machine? Norman Dean's patent 2886976 of his electromechanical inertial drive has intrigued millions for a better part of a century. So why hasn't someone built a flying machine based on its principle by now? The problem, as it turned out, were patent rights protection. Dean laid out his art so skillfully that without extensive research, even the most clever engineer could not duplicate all the variables. For example, what are and how do you harmonize the proper shift timing, clutch timing, stroke length, system amplitude, rotor mass, spring tensions, and the placement of slider switches. But was the Dean drive for real? Despite these hurdles, obviously the system worked because in the 1960s, there were many credible witnesses, including the late William O. Davis. Dr. Davis, who worked for the US Air Force at the time, was so convinced that he calculated Dean drives could exist in the universe. Davis even went so far as to propose an antonym to Newton's laws of motion, a fourth law. The energy of a given system can only be changed in some finite length of time, depending on the system, and never in zero time. The conservation laws of energy and momentum are upheld because the power demands are periodic. Neutral frames. Davis coined the term critical action time or cat, used to define the period when a mass is subjected to a force and when it begins to react to that force. Because there are gaps between action and reaction, there can be separate inertial frames in a machine. Within Dean drives, we can witness three inertial frameworks at play. One, the rotors and their angular momentum driving the carriage. Two, the carriage itself as it oscillates with the rotors. Three, the main frame load that houses the above complex. Dr. Davis's theoretical model of a unidirectional impulse drive or unbalanced oscillator. A, the oscillator, sine wave or sawtooth waveform may be critical. A is also uh, what we call the carriage. B, long time signal path. C, short time signal path. D, clutch, timing is critical. E is clutch. F is a frame, frame load. 
Impulse direction is towards the left. Making of a Dean Drive. Step one, build the oscillator by channeling rotary motion. To do this, suspend the rotor axle, creating a second inertial frame within the system. Step two, counter spinning weights mounted on a suspended second inertial frame or carriage will propel that carriage bidirectionally when both rotors swing to either side of said carriage. This is a balanced mechanical oscillator. Note, forces generated by the eccentric rotors when their armatures are in line with actual conjunction are canceled out. Conveniently, cancellation and addition forces hold true for both horizontal and vertical carriage systems. Fine, but now we have a problem. One would logically predict the carriage to swing in the opposite direction of the rotors, right? Nope. A fundamental anomaly. The resultant mechanical oscillator is a balanced system. It converts 360 degree rotary motion into a powerful 180 degree bidirectional force. Why does the carriage swing with the rotors instead of away as would be predicted by Newton's third law? The reason, since the rotors are counter spinning, side forces are canceled out and the carriage swings towards the sum of the rotors angular momentum demonstrating centrifugal force can be isolated from the centripetal. Step three, rectify it. Next, we take advantage of low rotor, rotor inertia to shift the axis of the eccentrics to make an unbalanced mechanical oscillator. This occurs at a precise time in the cycle when the rotors are approaching zero line between negative and positive phase. The genius is in the timing. We take advantage of the rotor's reduced inertia when their armatures align, R to R, and the rotor's inertia are negligible because they are moving in the right direction, making the system extremely efficient. In shifting the rotor's axles, we decrease the cat of the system in positive phase to release repetitive centrifugal surge accelerations. These forces are then applied to the third initial frame, the housing of the engine with its load. Okay, awesome. We have a rectified mechanical oscillator and a pup puts along like a pissed off squirrel in a shoebox. But wait. Something doesn't look right. The rotors are making elliptical patterns that are tilted. The ellipse on the left is a classical notion of how a rotor appears when subjected to a bilinear motion. The ellipse on the right represents the described pattern of what actually occurs under these conditions. Okay, plane of oscillation is left to right, right to left. Phenomena of phasing in Dean rotors. This is because the rotors are driving the carriage 45 degrees ahead of themselves. This too is not predicted in classical mechanics. So timing of the shift must take this 45 degree phase lag into consideration. This is one of the major stumbling blocks for engineers trying to get a Dean drive to work. Surge, a third form of motion. 
Obviously, in Dean drives, the classic notion of spinning rotors on an oscillating axle does not hold true. In reality, such a rotor can have as much as 135 degree separation between its velocity and acceleration vectors instead of the usual 90 degrees we see in rotary motion. 135 degrees. So 90 degrees plus 45. Third derivative effects. Furthermore, when subjected to a linear shifting action, the rotor produces far more force than what could be predicted in classical mechanics. The Davis arc appears to be where this mythical inertial radiation or virtual energy, postulated by Davis, originates from the eccentric Dean drive rotor. Improving on the Dean drive. In the 1950s, Norman Dean did not have the luxury of a huge variety of spring types and rates to experiment with. Nor did he have digital electronics or access to compact and powerful electric motors. In fact, the motors used on our engines were built in the late 1980s. And though of high quality Japanese engineering, they do not use rare earth magnets. Recent designs and motor technology would make our engines even more lighter and powerful. Our other contributions to the Dean drive at this juncture have been in the dampening of the carriage recoil, shortening the recovery time. We also incorporated an electronic commutator and consolidation of all machine components. Most importantly, we reconfigured the suspension system. Let's glance at some of the steps we've taken to arrive at a practical impulse drive. Um, this is engine E2 with power supply E1. Uh, engine E3, uh, that is not a Dean drive. Uh, the, this one, uh, the first one is a Bueller drive. The second, uh, third, engine E3 is a, a radial vector drive. It's not a Dean drive. This is power supply PS2. This is engine E6 with a cover box and load sled. And this weird looking little engine is engine E9, a little Herman Munster mobile. It uses a um, uh, rod, um, a rack and pinion rod to impact with an asymmetrical oscillator, marginal thrust. This is a two cycle Dean drive, engine E8, that's patent drawing. Um, we had issues of, with getting the carriages to synchronize or desynchronize so that we'd get thrust out of it. Uh, this is engine E5, a four cycle drive. It too has issues with desynchronization. And here's e, uh, E5 uh, on its back. Of all the engines I've built, <clears throat> few had the force needed to propel us in space, but my single cycle Dean drive showed the most promise. So I had to go back to the beginning to review and reset parameters. Inertial engine E4. I built my first Dean drive in 1992 and tried to stay true to Norman L. Dean's first patent. It is a junk box jalopy made from whatever parts I could find. Dr. Tom Vallone was the first physicist to witness its operation back in 1995. It can be viewed in operation on my first YouTube video. 5.4 pounds, ounces, uh, rotors are 4.6 ounces times two. Rotors require 17 watts of power, shifter 19 watts, total 36 watts to operate. Power supply PS3. Dean drives require two separate voltages. I built this custom dual DC power supply for engine E4 in 1992. Then beefed it up in 1996 for other engines. Uh, PS3 delivers upwards of 300 watts if needed. 
inertial engine E6. I built this second modified Dean drive in 1995. E13, the engine that we will be demonstrating today, the asymmetric impulse drive, is an upscale version of this drive, but with many new innovations. Engine E6 may be viewed on uh, my third YouTube video. This is a single voltage uh, engine, variable speed, 2.6 pounds. Rotors are 4.4 ounces together, 13 watts average. Power supply PS5. Dean drives are extremely efficient. As it turned out, I needed a power supply that I could easily move about that didn't promise to Frankenstein me with 10 amps of DC current on the damp basement floor of my earlier laboratory. So I built the lower wattage PS5. Asymmetric impulse drive. Engine weight, 8.7 pounds. Uh, it be actually would have been 7.7 .7 pounds if I could have gotten some threaded aluminum rods. Here I used brass, which uh, support rods, which increased the weight of the engine by an extra pound. Unlike my other drives, this engine was designed to be adjustable in all facets. But I had to go back to a dual voltage power source, PS5, one fixed for the shifter, and a variable for the motor so I could fine tune rotor speed. This simple erector set design allows us to adjust shifter stroke length, to establish carriage amplitude, to choose various spring rates, easy access to all parts, ease of assembly and adjustments and repair, can be easily upscaled. Here we have a couple of my patent drawings. Dean and Davis were right. Before the mainframe can react to the impulse from the carriage, the carriage is already recovering its position during that initial delay of the mainframe's mass load. <clears throat> this can be witnessed in slow-mo in our latest YouTube video that we will see shortly. Like the kid on the playground swing, a 10 degree tilted pendulum offers the least resistance to the drive under test. Excellent efficiency. Shifter, 25% duty cycle only requires 10 watts. Rotors, about eight watts. Total power consumption around 18 watts average to get 14 to 20 pounds impulse, which comes out to about one watt to one pound of force. Uh, I think I know this one. This was our first accelerometer test. Uh, G-force came out to be around 1.6 G average. Engine was free hanging. This was our earlier load cell test. Engine secured to the bench through the load cell down here bolted to this plate, which is anchored with a pony vise and clamped down to the bench. And the engine is free hanging, but it can't swing. It's bolted to the bench. And we are getting about 20 pounds of impulse at close to four, four cycles per second, four hertz. This is a testing apparatus devised by Glenn used for the next set of experiments. <clears throat> okay, uh, this is the G-Force. Uh, we use the Physics Lab Assistant Accelerometer test program. Uh, as you can see, the green trace goes up past two, two Gs. Now, remember this trace form because you will see it again under a load cell test. And this is very interesting. We're going to take a close look at the load cell trace form, which is very similar to this pattern. Again, this engine was free hanging. 
Again, this is for one cycle with a duration of 440 milliseconds. Now we reduce the rotor voltage to eight volts DC for uniform clarity so that we can see the wave, wave pattern. Note the near identical tracking of the waveform pattern in the next slide, also one cycle, same duration. Here's a load cell test. Uh, upwards of 13 and a half pounds of force. We actually have four positive pulses in one cycle here. And I will explain that to you. It's very interesting. Okay, short time signal path, the ride. Cycle starts at mark 300. Actually, the cycle starts here. Starting from carriage mid-range, R to R, the rotors drive the carriage forward while the solenoid fires, advancing the carriage and gaining cat. The rotors then impart acceleration to the mainframe during that 100 milliseconds with five pounds force which is about 22% of the cycle. So here, uh, the, the solenoid is activated, pulls the carriage forward while the rotors are also going in the same direction. There's five pounds of force. Long time signal path, the walk back home. At 400 milliseconds, the solenoid releases and the carriage rapidly retreats to negative phase with a slight ringing of 50 milliseconds. The carriage releases, there's a ringing of the engine, slight. And a residual pulse of 50 milliseconds with two pounds force. There's another pulse of two pounds. This inertial lag of 100 milliseconds accounts for another 22% of the cycle. The cycle continues at mark 65 milliseconds. So the cycle continues here. The rotor carriage complex reaches peak negative phase when, when the first large positive spike manifests on the mainframe with 13 and a half pounds of force. Okay, the carriage is all, already towards the back of the mainframe when this pulse occurs. This 20 mill, uh, 25 millisecond spike is the mainframe's delayed reaction to the solenoid firing. Then the mainframe reacts according to Newton's third law and gives a short negative recoil spike of 15 milliseconds. Recoil spike. This 40 millisecond event accounts for 9% of the cycle. Now this gets interesting. From 100 milliseconds to 300 milliseconds, 100 milliseconds to 300 milliseconds. The mainframe is now reacting to a large phantom pulse of 60 milliseconds with eight pounds impulse from the rotor centrifugal force, Davis's virtual energy. Delayed reaction, carriage is nowhere near the front end of the engine, the mainframe. You can see the carriage dampening effect in this pulse, after which the carriage is free to finish dampening for another 140 milliseconds, settling into RR mid-range. So here's the carriage. It's trying to dampen out, but that pulse is there. And then the pulse is gone and the carriage is dampening out, getting ready to start another cycle. This phenomenon is 200 milliseconds and accounts for 47% of the cycle. So as you see here, in one cycle, we have four positive pulses. Here's 
Here's uh, Glenn and I's contact information. Well, I hope you enjoyed our presentation. And I'm, Glenn and I are both looking forward to hearing from you. Thank you.